Um, normally Tuesday night live, but this week Monday night live because I've got stuff to do tomorrow. So, uh, what can we tell you? Well, uh, we've got various new stuff going on. Very interestingly, um, last week I went to see the new Accuracy International ATX rifle, which might be the main topic of tonight's conversation because I have notes shooting with the rifle to form an immediate opinion and the people around and explaining what was going on and some of the design process and ethos behind it were also extremely good so I am rather impressed just to get things going tonight before the questions start streaming in I got a question earlier from uh, Jerry McCown who said hi Chris I'm in the middle of applying for my FAC and looking at some rifles what would you recommend Maybe you can answer it tonight in your live stream. Cheers, Jerry. Well, number one, we could do with a little bit more information. And I do have a brief conversation back and forth with him, you know, trying to narrow it down a little bit. But as usual, he wants it for target and hunting and, you know, lots of other, you know, fairly contradictory requirements. But, he, you know, he put down, he's, he's been looking at a T3X in 6.5 or 308. Um, his budget's about one to two thousand pounds. Uh, I hope he's maybe realised he needs to put quite a lot more on top of that for his scope as well because, you know, by the time you get to a thousand pounds, rifles are shooting pretty well and you need a good optic to make the most of them. Um, so, if he wants to go in at the bottom end, you could go in straight away. And number one was he's a member of a rifle range, Rifle Club Guarders Guns, so he's not going to be doing any hunting there, that's for sure. Um, I was thinking maybe going with a Bagara B14 HMR as the kind of lower option, or one of the one of the Howers in a in a chassis, or or one of the more sort of target varmint stocks. But it's all a question of you know what sort of distances does he want to shoot, and you know is he you know is he shooting paper? Is he shooting steel? Garders maybe probably steel if he's at the the um, the steel plate range up in Estelle Mill. So again, you know, there's a lot of questions. Now, if he's gonna if he's got that is just his rifle budget. Why not push it further? Why not go up to um, perhaps a, a Mauser M18 chassis, long range chassis, which I reviewed a few weeks ago. Uh, that's a very nice rifle. It's one I pretty much enjoy shooting myself. Um, I mean, all the ones I've mentioned so far are all, all, all good to shoot, but uh, that, that, you know, takes it up a little notch. But anyway, that's a brief, uh, a, a brief response for you because as you may imagine, Jerry, I get a million and one questions of pretty much the same thing. What's the best rifle? for 1,000 to 2,000 pounds for hunting and target. And you do sort of leave quite a large um, gap in the, in the information on either. Right, good evening to um, Chris602, who is not Chris617. I look like we've got a bit of a, a smudgy, steamy picture tonight. I'm just gonna adjust the camera very slightly. Being as it's on YouTube, I can't really set up too much in advance without it um, doing some odd stuff. That's maybe a bit better. Could always pop out the ceiling light because that usually does something crazy. But I might not because it'll fall out and go smash. Um, right, questions. Steve, good evening. John Heaton Armstrong. Um, oi oi, yes, very good. <laughs> right, well, somebody say, tell us about this new Accuracy International um, ATX. All right then, I will. The Accuracy International AT is currently one of my, it's, it's a very nice rifle and I do like it a lot. Um, one of my very good friends has one, he's had it for three or four years. Um, and it is a very good rifle, both from accuracy terms, handling, ergonomics, a lot of things. But it's not a perfect rifle. Let's face it, it's designed and, and, and descended from a military precision sniping rifle. So AI, I went to the, went to the AI meet last week at Bisley on Friday, which is a specific um, specific in, in, uh, invitation, invitation due to launch the new AT rifle. And this was on the Chobham range there, which is kind of in the danger zone beyond the end of Stickledown. It's a very, very interesting range. You'll have to read the article when I write it. Um, so what have they done? Well, basically, the one thing I don't like about the AT is it's still kind of got a military trigger. And although it's good and you can shoot it well, I think it's probably a little bit spaced different to how people want to shoot precision rifles now. So the number one thing they've done is 
they've taken the AT barreled action, which already has um, an Accuracy International made cut rifle barrel. Accuracy International have been cut rifling their own barrel since uh, October 2019. So the normal AT is bonded into its chassis. So this one, it's not bonded. So you've got AI barrel, AT action, it's the three lug 60 degree lift. Um, it's a very, very good bolt. It's a very good bolt. Uh, three position safety catch. And they put it into their own in-house chassis system. It's not bonded in. So if you want to buy one of these, you can have your rifle debonded and put in one of those. I know my, my pal Chris has already said he wants one, so he's got to get his done. Um, when, of course, he can get one. Uh, I believe delivery dates on this rifle are going to be sort of towards the um, final quarter of the year. To give you a brief rundown now, we've got 10 rounds. AX mag, which is the twin column, twin stack feeds from both sides. Ambidextrous mags, mag catch. Um, it's got uh, AI key slot. Uh, the, there's a picture of it on the uh, introduction the thumbnail to this video. AI key, AI key slot everywhere. Uh, it's got the RRS specification, Arca Swiss rail, so it means it's going to fit your decent gear. Um, Arca Swiss is, after all, camera gear. Uh, it comes with, it's a 24 inch AI made barrel, uh, one in eight, and only in 6.5 Creedmoor to start with. The first delivery batch of, of factory rifles effectively are going to be fairly limited in specification. There will be more options later on probably. We were specifically told um, there will be no left handers and there will be no magnums. But at a later date there may be a few more calibers sort of around the medium action length, which it already is of course. Um, what else we got? So yeah, tw 24 inch bar, 18 twist. It's a 5.8 24 thread, so you can put a brake or a moderator on it. Um, the big deal on it is, and I can't touch rifles on YouTube Live, but the big deal is it's a very low pro profile chassis with a very square barricade stock on it. And what this means is that the barrel axis, the bore line above the support line, is very close. And when you shoot this thing, it is exactly as was suggested the linear recoil path on it is fundamentally excellent um what else nothing particularly surprising 20 moa rail it's a low profile rail um other good factors it's a fully adjustable trigger it's a two-stage trigger it will go down to about a pound and a half um again i'm waiting for full specification list on this which i'm going to get wednesday so this is pretty much what i picked up off my video recording of the actual briefing itself um you can have a four end bridge on it that goes across it's got flush cups and of course the back end it's got the, the the starting ones are going to be all fixed stock but at a later date there will be a folding option available and the stock bolts together in the back end which i believe is where the hinge may well be retrofittable but number one thing i love is it's got um, a laterally adjustable cheek piece as well as height so you get a great linear head position Recoil pad, it's adjustable length of pull, it's adjustable angle, it's got you know grip tape underneath so you can place it wherever you want, nip it down. It's got an underside sort of buttstock bag rider, you can add accessories, whatever you like to it. It's a very well thought through rifle, doesn't seem to show any weak spots. Um, I had about 20 shots to it. We're only uh, sitting using a set of uh, a very nice tripod set up with, um, with a fluid ball head on it uh, on the Chobham range, which is all on steel plates. So... Um, those are the main factors. The price is 3750 sadly, plus VAT, which makes it £4,500 in the UK. Um, I want one. There we go. Right, let's have a look at some of the questions tonight. So, Boris XTR rings, how much is it uh, to MOR adjustment? Uh, you probably mean MOA adjustment. It depends how far apart you put them. The closer you put them together for the maximum uh, up at the back and down at the front, you know, the more it angularly adjusts the scope. But if you uh, go on the website, it will tell you. You know, it gives you a rough approximation of distances between blah, blah, blah. There's actually a set hanging on a peg on the other side of that wall, but I'm not going in the way to get them because I'll block the camera. Um, but yeah, if you, if you, if you look on the, um, the Burris website, I think it gives you a little bit of a, a, a rough thing. So... John Heaton Armstrong pricing, I think I just told you that one. Yes, right, uh, velocity will be an AI, um, uh, the ATX, there will be a chassis for REM 700 footprint. We shot REM 700 in it, there's photos of me doing that as well. Just put a plain Jane 308 in the chassis and of course the fit. 
Uh, they also had a Bagara um, rim fire, which they put in as well, which of course is also based on the rim 700 footprint. <laughs> Externally, it's indistinguishable, except that the, the, the AI was red and then the, the, the rim 700 chassis was blue. So you'll, you'll see those in the photos at some point. It will come up on my page or there might be a video. Um, I am promised a rifle at some point. There's not many of them around at the moment. They sent quite a few over to the US because the US, I think, kind of leaked the release before the UK did. Um, we had, there the, the can't have been more than about 20 people, I think maximum there all day Friday. And um, we, we, we sort of used two rifles between the lot of us, but it was nice. Um, but yeah, that chassis is going to be a good seller too. We didn't get a specific price on the chassis, but we were told it would be, um, how did they phrase it now? It would be about market going rate, I think was the expression used. Um, I don't think it's going to be crazy because, to be honest, for that rifle, for £4,500, including VAT, I don't think that's excessive at all, given the fact that shooting it... Mm. Right. Uh, what do we got next then? Uh, right, I know they're a world apart, but is the low bore axis similar to the RX chassis? Um... Without putting them side by side, in fact, I've not looked at the photos of them directly, but no, I, I don't. It was extremely low because there's basically there's a thin piece of aluminium between the barrel and, 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 and whatever you rest it on. And there was a lot more than that to the uh, to the Oryx, certainly to things like the ACC and things like that. Uh, I will have a good look at some photos, actually, and get a bit of a, a rough assessment on that. But visually, it's one of those rifles I could tell visually just looking at it on this tripod in front of us. I've just been watching my video now, noting down some of the specifications. Um, it just it just looks right. It just looks right. And of course, with all the AI key slot on it, it, you can get all the weights and everything like that to give you the balance you want. And of course, with the forend being narrow and shallow, barricades, barricades, you know, the, the, the cutouts and things on them. That's what it's been designed exactly to do because the makers of the best sniper in the rifle in the world um, have basically said to their competition shooters, how can we make our rifle better for competition? And this is what they've come up with for both U US and UK. It, um, it, it seems like a good approach to have taken. Right. Hi, Chris. Uh, loving the channel. Con can I con uh, sorry. Hi, Chris. Um, loving the channel and content. Keep it up, buddy. Thank you. I've not been doing so much recently because I've just been very busy with other, um, other paid work. Um, Right, Edward Sheraton. Hi, Chris. Great looking rifle. How heavy is the rifle? Which one, Edward? Um, you, you won the hat last fortnight ago, but you never messaged me to give your address details. And you know, hats here for interesting questions. So please send me a message, get in contact, private message or whatever on, on, on my Facebook page. It's Chris Parkin Shooting Sports. Um, not Chris Parkin, just Chris Parkin. That's my personal page. Chris Parkin Shooting Sports page. Or message me through um through youtube which is where you probably watch me and see me now so which rifle edward are we talking this rifle or the ai or which we didn't get a specified weight for the ai uh, and the weight for this i can't remember off the top of my head this will be about three and a half kilos um bear weight of course right well we've got 41 people watching uh, i know in the uk it is of course the first night of Pubs and things being open. Uh, I've just, just been down past mine actually because I haven't get a pint of milk from the shop and it didn't seem heavingly busy. So, but we shall see. Uh, right, Leslie Woods, evening all. Oh dear, well on my screen we've got a pulsar ad popping up. Um, I'm not sure about your screens. Hopefully there'll be some questions come through in a moment. Are we still live on there? I'll just refresh this page here. So, oh yeah, there's another one come through. Right, the Boris question was, how much is too much adjustment? I worried about flexing my scope. Sorry, fat fingers. Right, well, that's the whole point. Do you know what? Just pause there one second. I'm looking for my, uh, I, I, I hung one up here. Here we go. Right, there's one here. I know there's only one because I've used one of them to make a 3D mount for um, an illuminator. Right, the whole point of the Burris rings, either the older signatures or the new XTRs, 
is if effectively you got something that um, I was always taught is called a rose joint. Effectively, I can't undo this quite in front of me because my fingers aren't, won't do the. Effectively, you've got a, a, an aluminium ring and you've got a plastic shim inside of it. And the plastic shim is effectively externally spherical. So that plastic shim can move in any rotational direction on the axes. So it doesn't matter how much you tip the scope up. The inserts uh, come in different thicknesses. You know, there's a whole load of them in the box here, which add different amounts of elevation. And they're all sort of different thicknesses, you see? Obviously, you can't see that clearly on here. But... Um, but essentially, because that rose joint pivots and can flex, the scope is naturally self-aligning, so you're not bending your scope. That's the big difference between using something like one of these and using, you know, a regular scope ring with a shim under one end, because you're shimming in parallel like, like that. Whereas when you use a signature ring, you're actually shimming in axis. And these axes at both ends self-align, so you're not damaging your scope. And that is why they're a, they're a great ring. They're a great. They're a bit bulkier, and you know they're not for everybody. But you can get an awful lot of elevation added on if you need it, or you don't have to put too much on at all. In fact, if I read the instructions, let's have a read of these instructions. There's quite a comprehensive table here, which talks all about uh, approximate ring spacing or which inserts you're using. And it's sort of listing between 5 and 40 minutes of angle. So, for example, if you have got, uh, let's have a look here. Right, if your rings are three and a half inches apart and you're using all the inserts, that's 54.24 MOA. Whereas if those same inserts are placed six inches apart, that's 31.63 MOA. Anyway, what you would do, you would set it up approximately... Zero your scope, see how much you've got left, see how much you need. And you can always swap the inserts, you know, play about a little, a little bit. Because these, you know, these are approximated dimensions. They're not um, approximate dimensions. They're not, you know, absolute gospel. So, yeah, I've had quite a few of these on various things. And yes, that one's actually got a, a, a PBRL illuminator stuck in it, I think, on a night vision scope. So I'll put those down there. Right, what's next? Have we got any more questions? Edward Sheridan, did you? Uh, I did send you my address. You might not have got my, my address. Uh, oh right, you've just told everybody, Edward, on YouTube worldwide what your address is. Um, could I suggest you might want to delete that comment for your own um, for your own sake? Uh, right. Does the AI have options for twist rate or throat depth? Ideally, you'd want to run heavier, longer bullets, and mag length on AI could be longer. Have they addressed that? Well, I was left under the impression that there may be options become apparent at a later date, but initially rifles are going to be built around a single base specification with an 18-inch twist 6.5 Creedmoor barrel. Uh, although many people want to harp on this, that and the other about throat length this and a, you know extra twist rate that, better ballistic coefficient bullets, blah, blah, blah. Uh, to me, a lot of the factors about PRS are the fact you need to be able to shoot accurately and quickly and consistently with your own bullet spot spotting your own bullet strike from multiple positions so it's not kind of this be all and end all about the absolute ultimate most accurate rifle in the world there's a lot more to do with the way it handles and shoots in my opinion so i'm not saying there won't be options in a future date but i don't work for ai um and i don't imagine there probably will be because you know it's a factory rifle if you go to seiko can you say oh, i want to an adjustable, you know, I want to specify a, a throat length of, of X, Y, Z because I want to use this obscure 163 grain 6.5 millimeter bullet or something, you know, it doesn't happen. And, you know, big manufacturers show an awful lot of commitment in what they make and what they specify to make them, you know, the best of both worlds. And, and to be fair, a lot of people second guess everything that's around them and instead of just going shooting and learning to shoot better. Um, right, Roger that. Cheers, Chris. You have quelled my worried mind. Uh, pleasure, Chris. Six o two. Right. So yeah, velocity. velocity um, I, I don't think everything is going to be uh, the bee's knees for you because in the day the Creedmoor was kind of designed. A lot of people. And bear in mind, I am a long-term two sixty Remington shooter. A lot of people question the two sixty Rem being 
too long in cartridge overall length and you lost case um, case volume if you were using long bullets. Now, I've loaded a 260 round, and mine's, I've got two of them built on REM 700 actions, normal short actions. So they've both got AICS mags on, which are the same length, but you know, the single feed rather than the double feed than the AW. I load it 2.845 cartridge overall length, which is C-O-L, there's no A in that. Um, and they work. I could squeeze them out to 2.5 if I needed to, but I don't need to because I'm using a good old fashioned tangent OG bullet that's not particularly jump sensitive. And you know what? I've been using the same load for 12 years. And if I miss, it's because I've misread the wind or I've made a bad shot. It's never, the, never that. So I tend to avoid finicky things with bullets with extremely high BCs and very long lengths, etc. etc. So the Creedmoor was designed. I say I didn't have that problem with the 260. Okay, if I'd have gone for super long, super pointy, modern, even the, even the latest bullets, I might have started to tweak it. But they're the ones that need to be seated out further to start going into the lands. I didn't need to do that with 139 grain lap or Senas. Um but the Creedmoor being a shorter case, it's slightly fatter towards the shoulder, so you keep the volume back there. It was designed to avoid that problem in a standard shorter action length. So I can't in any way, shape or form see you having a problem with seating that bullet length in, in uh, the AW, which is based around, you know, ballpark short action dimensions. Right. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Leslie Woods. Hi Chris, do they make a different chassis for the Vergara B14 and have they sorted the light strikes? Right, number one, um, I presume you mean the Vergara B14. And, it, oh yeah, it uh, and as for a different chassis, well, you can put whatever you want because a, a B14, it's um, it's REM 700 footprint, so you can do what you want with it. And that's the whole point of the B14 rimfire as well. They did exactly the same thing. Is my camera a little bit wonky, by the way? I do apologise if it is. Right, uh, well, that's about it for questions tonight, by the looks of it. Anybody got any more? What time are we on? Oh, we've only done 20 past eight as well. Come on then, bring them on, chaps. Edward, um, contact me via my Facebook page because you can't, you know, you don't want to be putting your, your, your address in public. I'm glad you've removed it. I don't think millions of people are going to have written it down. Don't worry. Um, now it's 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 budding me, it's bugging me. Now. So I'm just going to tweak my camera ever so slightly. Hopefully, I'm not going to drop it. Let's try that. Oh, another question has just popped up. Right, hi Chris, your content and knowledge is great, but your internet picture is crap. Yes, I know, because everybody's using the internet, aren't they? And I'm very sorry that I'm not um, a broadband specialist. Can't help there. Sorry. Uh, every, you know, some of these videos take hours and hours to upload, so my, my, my internet can get quite uh, busy at times. Even Chris... Uh, wanted your advice, Sightline N470S versus Sightmark Rafe for Kona 223. I'm not answering questions about Sightmark Rafe at all. Sorry. Um, sorry. I've, I've done them to death. I've done videos. Um, please have a, have a watch back over them. Right. Uh, sorry, man. Looking at getting into reloading. Uh, what's the best route to get in the setup? There's some starter kit to be Lee, or is it best to buy individual bits of kit? I, I'd probably go individual bits of kit, to be honest. Um, I've got quite a lot of lead kit, but I'm not really a fan of lead presses because I don't like presses that don't cam over top dead centre. Um, I'd be going with a Lyman or a Forster or an RCBS or a Hornady press maybe, um, but not a lead press. But I've got loads of lead dies and all sorts of lead bits and pieces, but I'm looking at my reloading bench now. On my bench I've got Forster Coax press, um, which uh, I bought that quite a long time ago and I've, I'm... I wouldn't buy it these days because I don't do that much reloading anymore, but wow, it's still a great press. I've got RCBS 505 scales, I've got some Lyman scales, I've got a, a Target Master Trickler, I've got a Lyman Trickler, I've got all sorts of dies. I've got Redding, I've got Lee, I've got RCBS, I've got Forster. There's just all sorts, all sorts. I don't think you'd, you'd find anybody really into reloading that had all his kit from one maker. They just tend to pick up bits as they go along and you know different makers do different things that are really really good so 
Uh, right. What's a good tactical chassis for the B14? Tech, tech, Jeremy can the picture is better now. It's just it's just the internet. I don't know what it is. It's just different every time, and I, I can't really do a huge huge amount about it. Um, good chat. Good tactical chassis for the Bugatti B14. Yes, that's very simple actually. Buy the AI one when it comes out sometime, probably later this year. Um, there, there was one actually in it at the, sh at the, 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 the thing with AI last week, so it's um, it, it, it's yeah, it's great. Um, I'm sure they'll have sorted the soft strikes, and if your soft strikes, just send it back. I mean, I sent mine back, but it's not like I wanted it giving back to me again. Um, it has got a spherical tip firing pin. I don't really see many rim fires with spherical tip firing pins. They all seem to have chisel tips, CZ and shuts all sorts. Um, and the Bagara didn't strike very hard uh, with with a spherical tip. Spherical tip seems fine on centre fires, but maybe not so much on rim fires. Right, David Levine, even Chris, um, do they do anything around long range rim fire with a 17 HMR, or is it a 2 2 thing? <sighs> There's nothing to stop you using a 17 HMR, but. Um, Obviously, again, the well-published size V4, CZ457 long range. I did a lot of stuff with that, with the 2.2 barrel on it. And then I realised I happened to have a 4.55 with a heavy 17 HMR barrel on it. I did a video, did the barrel change, did some shooting with it. It was a windy day I had it. Um, you gained all the benefits of the ergonomics of that excellent rifle and stock. Uh, the barrel was equally heavy, just not fluted. Uh, it didn't have a match chamber, but then again, what's a match chamber with a 17 HMR? Because we've had decades upon decades upon decades of, of refined 2 2 rimfire match ammunition. 17 HMR has been around, what, 15 years? Um, and it's had its own ups and downs. Ammunition, factory ammunition centre fires has its ups and downs. Rimfire ammunition has its ups and downs. And I think over all that time, the one that's had the greatest standing in the, the, the you know the match precision and match repetition um, consistencies 2-2 two -two rimfire and I shot some 350 meter targets with 17 HMR with 2-2 two -two rimfire and I would shoot 2-2 two -two rimfire in preference but you know for hunting requirements out say 150-175 meters yeah I'd go 17 HMR every day because it's it's ballistically far superior with a flatter trajectory to hunting ranges but yeah, in terms of uh, long range room fire, I think I'd definitely be going 2 2. And to me, part of the reason I like long range room fire is it's quiet. It's just quite relaxing. You know, it's a bit of a break. Uh, do you know anything about KDEX defence rifles and chassis systems? No, nothing at all. Nothing at all. I deal with mainstream bulk availability kit. Kdex, um, I couldn't even picture one in my head. I mean, obviously I've heard of them, but I couldn't picture one in my head. It's, do you know what? Most things I do are sporting rifles anyway, but you know the crossover is is consumer driven in the fact that you know exactly like the guy said to me earlier, I want a, a rifle for for hunting and target, which you know <laughs> they invented the Creedmoor and everybody seemed to want a rifle for hunting and target because they thought you know everything would be the same. Um, Whereas, you know, you have something like this, which is a superb modern representation of an ideal stalking rifle in the UK. It's stainless, it's synthetic, it feeds well, it shoots well, the trigger's good, it's accurate, it's lightweight, it's not resonant, it's got an adjustable cheek piece, a better cheek position, head position. It's kind of a, what do we need to do? This is a bit like, like AI have said, right, we've got a great rifle, how do we make it better? For this specific market well sour have kind of looked at you know you could say they looked at the uk stalking market and said what exactly do we need to do to a rifle to make it ideal for it there you go there you go um taking this uh, i've got i've got a stalking trip sorted out for this and i'm i'm away to somewhere um in, over the next week or so that's um notoriously wet and miserable but i love shooting there and um, yes, I'm not going to treat it brutally, but I'm not going to sort of kid gloves it because I want to know. But I mean, I've already had it wet through and this, that and the other. Um, and it's, what's it been here for? A couple of weeks? 
It's not Mr. B. It's not Mr. B. The only thing I would say about it is it's very precisely made, which is never a bad thing. So much so, I mean, I went through, I don't know, seven or eight rounds of ammunition, uh, brands of ammunition, no problem at all. And I went through another, another brand, specifically very long head spaced, very difficult to chamber, close the bolt, and they were fiery hot to shoot as well. The chronograph was virtually melting underneath them, they were that fast. Um, so the, the, the well-built, precise made rifle with, you know, great chamber tonnes, this, that and the other, soon shows off where ammunition isn't, isn't such a good fit. Um, but that's not, there's nothing wrong with this because there were say seven or eight brands went through it just fine, which were which were good. And and I measured headspace on some of the cases off the other lot. They weren't great. They were, they were you know, only only takes a couple of foul long, and it goes from being a smooth fit to being a wow. This is a bit snug to being the kind of close to the ball. There we go. Anyway, right. Mm -hmm. Dave Levine, what's the verdict on your M18? Have you killed it? Um, oh, my MA3, it's a bit pitted, it's a bit corroded, but you know what, <laughs> still shoots all right, it's not as per but maybe as good as it was, but um, it'll still shoot sub MOA three round groups. The only, the, see, the thing with that is, it's been used for a lot of night vision setup, and night vision use, and it's not so bad with, you know, the more modern night vision where you can put them in daylight mode, because it's a lot easier to zero them. But some of the older stuff, um, and especially thermal as well, you do tend to use more rifles zeroing. And I'm, I'm one that I really like to be very consistent with my zero because I don't like anything to, to you know, to not be quite right. And yes, I'm fortunate and I've, I've reasonably good ammunition supply, so I can, I don't need to, you know, absolutely stretch every box of ammunition to the last shot because I respect the fact that ammunition is expensive and. You know, a box of 20 it could be 20 foxes or it could be 18 rounds of zeroing and two foxes and oh, I've run out of ammo again. And to be fair, I bet you I've, I would easily use a box of 20, 20 rounds zeroing a, a thermal or something like that because I want to be very sure. And you've usually got a slightly compromised aiming solution and you just, the, the more you shoot, the more you like to iron out any errors, as long as you know what you're doing, of course. Um... So yeah, it's it's past its best, but it does still work. It's not dead yet. Plus, I really like it. I was a bit sad when I saw it was past its best. Next question. This is velocity again. Next question. Just sold my 1022. Was thinking of pushing out to 300 yards, maybe further with a 22LR. What rifle do you suggest? Was thinking Ruger Precision Rimfire. Well, you could, but you don't mention your budget, and I have to say, I've used pretty much, well, I've used the Roof Precision, I've used the Begar, I've used the CZ, I've used some other Savage, I've used, you know, I'd go CZ, I really would, I think it's the, and since I bought that 457 LRP, they're doing a, a, a slightly lighter varmint, I think it is now, or a slightly lighter is it a synthetic or a polymer stock, I, 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 I don't know, I see so many guns every week, um, and I have to, I think that was I'm doing the same thing this month. I, I might look at more like that because I love the ergonomics on the 457 LRP, but it's it's a little bit heavier and I like it so much. I don't want to use my old lightweight 22 hunting rifle. I want to use the LRP. So if I could have lost a teeny bit of weight off that, that would have been ideal. But um, yeah, I, I can't see me changing my mind on that one anytime soon. The Ticker T1 is a nice rifle, but I'm waiting to see that, you know, available with better stock options. And I wasn't thrilled with the stock on the, um, oh, what was it called now? They did, they did a Centify version with a, a synthetic, more sort of tactical stock on it. And it was quite comfy on the top end, but the, the, the book on it wasn't, wasn't awesome. And it certainly wasn't quite as, um, as funky as the CZ one. But that is a good rifle. Hi Chris, this is a ticker fan. Uh, well, you've you've nailed your uh, nailed your flag to the mast there if you're a ticker fan. Hi Chris, will the ATX crossover into other uses or is it just a PRS rifle? <laughs> um, yeah, it'll cross over into any use really. Um, what do you want it to do? Because you know it's a 24 inch barrel, 65 Creedmoor, so it's ballistically very capable. It's accurate. It's very nice to shoot. Um, it'll make a great, you know, long distance varminter. If you want to carry it, you can shoot deer with it. Um, it'll make um, a 
them. You know, everybody says, oh, I want to shoot long range target. Well, what? Do you want to just go and shoot steel plates? Because if you do, yes, it'll make a superb rifle for that too. Because that's effectively what PRS is. PRS to me is long range steel plate shooting with more difficult, um, difficult shooting positions. So, you know, it's all good fun. And it, it, I like that because it kind of puts more onus onto the shooting skill and not just the, uh, my camera's wonk, isn't it? The shooting skill and not just, you know, the, the fundamental, oh, my rifle's more accurate than yours or whatever. I seem to be doing a lot of fiddling with this camera tonight. So, yeah, um, I liked the ATX. I really did like it. Um, I don't have four and a half thousand quid burning a hole in my pocket. If I did, I wouldn't doubt my purchase. I wouldn't doubt it. It's a nice rifle. Right. I've shot an Ed, Ed, Edward Sheridan. I've shot an Accuracy International in 308 out to 520. Yes, what great feeling hitting a steel plant. Great day. Yeah, um, interestingly, if you've shot a lot of rifles and then you shoot an, an Accuracy International, there's a lot to be said about the, before the ATX came out. A lot, lot to be said about the standard they're capable of they're you know jokingly squaddy proof they are you know the german is it the bundeswehr or some of the german guys use these the americans buy them and that's saying a lot you know um it's a fundamentally very solid rifle and that's the thing they've made that fundamental solidity more applicable to not being dropped out of a helicopter and more applicable to to, to using it for precision shooting so what was a precision sort of maybe slightly bigger bulky heavy rifle is now precision slightly lighter slightly slimmer slightly more maneuverable rifle um and to me the i could live with an at and i can live with the trigger on one if someone said there's a rifle i go great fantastic i'm very happy with that um but the tr the match trigger on the x is is far more similar to you know any any other match serious match grade trigger it's a two stage unit the one on the a, on the on the ax on the at is standard and the ai is standard or the ax axmc it's a two stage but it's quite heavy and it it, it feels like you know say you add you know 1500 grams pull and then 1501 is the is the breaking point whereas the normal two stage is kind of the other way around you put sort of a gram on as your first stage and then you've got slightly stronger pull for your second stage it's hard to explain um but you see they're designed to be just brutally brutally precise and brutally reliable and does a match precision prs shooter need that perhaps not and i'm not saying it's any less reliable but it's certainly not designed to be dropped out of a helicopter um as was always told to me by certain friends of mine um so yeah it's it's a real case of you know making something that's very good at something very good at something else with just a few details tweaked uh so yes it's not just a prs rifle it will cross over uh leslie woods right me again chris <laughs> only me um right uh, i only have a 2-2 on my ticket going up going to put a variation in front of the caliber what caliber for foxes at 200 meters 223 easy life plenty of ammunition it's not too noisy it's got you know good barrel life it's just a great cartridge i use it i prefer it over many others for, for specifically that need i think the only thing i really really do appreciate going up to a 243 and it's easy ages since i've got a 22 250 is i just find the bigger cartridge is a bit less of a fiddle in the dark if you've got to do a bit of manual reloading or anything like that but it's not a big deal um and for what they got in absolute you know wind windage or you know wind oh, wind resistance capability and slightly harder hitting flatter trajectory um it's not that windy i mean around me i've not got that much problem with those bad conditions it's not particularly open terrain and i don't know i just don't like making huge amounts of noise at night i'm quite modest and discreet in that respect um so i started out with 22 250 and that's a right banger so back in the days without moderators and stuff like that um so yeah, you go 223 you'll never regret having a 223 i i had a triple two for a while i i started out 22 250 then i think i went 243 then i went triple two and then I went two, two, three. 
And then I started doing this job and I'd just do pretty much anything. Um, but again, I tend to go back to the 223 if it's, you know, my choice, my time. Right. Uh, right, ticker fan. Seems a big selling point is the recoil. A uh, little bit more information on that on detail. Sorry, a bad post selling point is the low. Right. Selling point is the low recoil pulse of the ATX. Can you describe how it how it shoots some more, please? Well, essentially, what ideally you want, if you imagine that's you know that's the recoil pad. Ideally, you want the recoil in the centre of the recoil pad. You don't want it at the top where you're going to get muzzle jump, or at the bottom where you know, it's, it's rarely ever going to be at the bottom. Because if you put it at the bottom, you'd have the scope you know way up in the air because you've still got the physical mass of the human shoulder, head, neck, and everything to to fit in there somewhere. So the point is, it's about minimising the space between the sort of key components and minimising the size of the unnecessary um, mechanicals. Um, so if you've got the ball line there and you can bring everything closer to that ball line and you can keep the scope quite low to it and you've got a good cheek piece design, which has got a slim cheek piece, it's got a hole free space so your jaw's never on anything, goes in under your cheek bone, it's windage adjustable and it's all these small factors and features that allow everything to just compress those tiny little and you're talking differences of millimeters but those differences of millimeters do have a significant effect when they're amplified through the you know the laws of leverage because if you if you extend the lever by a millimeter you're extending you know extending the, the leverage force exerted so it's um it's <laughs> It's something I don't really even think about because I'm sort of of that background, but it's just a smart design. It's just been well done. I was talking to the engineer at AI. Uh, he, he was from an aerospace background and um, we were talking about the materials and, and, and polymers and this, that and the other, because it's kind of a bit of my background as well. And um, it was just... The stock just has a slight purity to it. It's been, you know, it just has this sort of goal and it's not got, it's finished, it's tidy. It doesn't sort of seem like a huge lump of metal that's been sort of scalloped here, scalloped there and made look pretty here and made look pretty there. And there's a lot of really nice looking stocks, but this one is just, just seems to be done very well. So I'd like to have shot it prone. We didn't shoot them prone. Um, prone is my absolute benchmark procedure for most things but we did shoot it off off a tripod setup which tripods can can rock quite a lot under recoil and i could see my bullet strike i don't know 350 meters i think i was shooting with it and um, which isn't that far but of course the closer it is the you know the more likely you you still are to be within that recoil impulse and your eye in the in the um, the eye box moving around because at long distance you've usually got a lot of time for the rifle to recover before you see the bullet go in and land Whereas at you know short and you know short short mid distances, I don't know two three hundred meters can be quite tricky because the gun's still jumping around quite a lot. The bullets only just got there, so yeah, it's um, it's all about making it efficient without compromise. Right, Chris six hundred two has uh, retracted a couple of messages. So right, in essence, the ATX mitigates the recoil without being uber heavy like some of the PRS rifles. Well, a lot of the weight on the PRS stuff, it's put there about balance and handling. I mean, I, um, let's face it, I mean, one of my things was archery. I shot compound bow for Great Britain. And, you know, you've got quite a small light bow, weighs, I don't know, four, four and a half pounds. I never used to even think about it in those days. To which you added additional carbon fibre stabilisers. You had a long rod out the front. I mean, fashions come, fashions go and changes things, you know, change. The changes and modifications altered through the time but at times i had a long rod on the end of a bow 45 inches long and you know 12 inch side rods on it weighing you know several pounds of additional weight and that's not in terms of you know recoil or anything that was all about balance and aiming and this that and the other so in the you know the same way when you've got all the um all, all the additional weights on the front you know you can you can use the weights for stability you can use the weights for recoil reduction you can use the weights for building up the size of the stock if you want to you know broaden the base of the, of the forehand or something like that it's a whole system of and ai are doing the weights that they don't come with it but you know they're available from ai 
they're designed to fit their chassis okay the chassis will fit other people's weights that use the kind of um you know, the arca swiss rs or, or the uh, i can't remember what it's called now the key slot that's what it's called the key slot system you know it's a common format for that reason and that's it because when you you know archery you're standing up you've got the weight of the bow holding the bow you've got balances of forces balance of mass and and this that and the other aiming solution and of course with a rifle that's what you're aiming for as well because you might be in a difficult kneeling position or using a barricade or or this that and the other makes shooting prone look relatively very simple uh, and that's why different people want a rifle to handle in different ways and you certainly want the balance point you know right on that barricade stop just forward so you can move it to where you want it um, and that also keeps you know imagine you put i've just put a huge moderator on my 260 it's about 750 grams wow does that calm the muzzle jump on its own regardless of recoil suppression from the moderator um just because it's you know it's a huge great mass on the end of a, a very big barrel uh right james robin hi chris great show again could you recommend a sling for a heavy varmint rifle 15 to 16 pounds would you like a double strap sling with qd flush cups to cross spread the weight um <clears throat> well uh, sorry it's a little thing pop up um i quite like biathlon slings i have got one um if you're walking a long way and you're not needing to take the rifle off in any kind of hurry the, you know that's sort of, I mean, a ski, a ski biathlon sling is designed to be, you know, whipped over the head very quickly for the competition format. Whereas the more, I mean, I had a, a Nigolo one that was um, clipped on, on the side. I put QD studs on the side of my 300 Winmo because it was a rifle I'd walk with all day and shoot maybe twice with warning. So I didn't have to, you know, kind of flip it away quickly. Something like a Vaughan rucksack is designed so you can take the rifle out very quickly. I've got rucksacks where the rifle will go in the rucksack, but you're not going to be getting it out in a split second like that. The Nigello um, slings, I think I put flush cups on, on those as well because I had a rifle with flush cups on the side. Funnily enough, it's actually sitting on my 457LRP at the moment because that's got flush cups on the side as well. And I would recommend on a biathlon one putting the flush cups or at least studs on the side so the rifle sits flat to your back with the bolt on the other side. Um, so yeah and, and of course having those two even though they're slightly thinner straps it spreads the load and it's not flopping backwards and forwards you're not holding on to it kind of going over and around things it's not fighting against your rucksack or things like that but you know do you need to carry a rucksack because if you need to carry a rucksack maybe look at a completely integrated solution so yes right um right then where we got to here this is a real beauty. What is the price range on it? Which one, Bob, cousin Bob? What's a real beauty? If you're talking about the AI, go back in the video. It's four and a half grand UK, including VAT. Uh, Chris Williams. Speaking of mods, I run a Hardy Gen 4 on my 270, which I bought for its light weight. It takes enough sting out of the shot to retain sight picture, but the sound reduction isn't great. Well, moderators sort of, there's, there's sound reduction, there's recoil reduction, there's longevity, and there's, there's weight, isn't there? And, and somewhere all those things come together. Um, everything's a kind of balance of those. Put a big heavy moderator on it, you'll certainly notice it, it tames the recoil purely through mass. And, and, and you know secondly through gas blast if you want to really cut recoil you use a brake because it's the gas blast that gives you the recoil um, if you put a huge great muzzle brake on that weighed as much as a moderator and had the you know the venting jet effect of a, of a brake yeah you'd really cut recoil um, but like you say the hard it's lightweight it's a historical one it's to take some of the noise off some of the recoil off so everything's a compromise everything's a compromise uh, I don't know anyone anywhere who's had the same rifle with every make of moderator under the sun to give a genuinely, you know, a genuine comparison with laboratory testing gear to um, to measure the recoil impulse. So most of it's theoretical or, or just a gut feel for it. And I suppose people like me, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't consider myself to be any kind of huge expert on anything, but because I get to shoot so many things and sort of compare them side by side, 
Uh, and, and the side-by-side -side comparisons are generally in my head, not physically on a bench or, or in the same scenario. And I find myself trying to do repetitive tasks because it gives me you know, a baseline for which to measure rifles against each other. Um, I mean, there's a rifle that this looks very much like, but they are very different. But visually, 100 metres away, nine times out of ten, most shooters couldn't tell the difference. But there are key differences, key differences. Um, side by side, would, would one shoot any better than the other? Probably not, no. But I know which one I'd have of the two of them. Similar price-ish. This might be a teeny bit more, I'm not sure. Um, only a little bit there. Right. So, yeah, the, the Hardy, you know, if you're happy with it, it was quite a light mod, the Hardy. It was a, a, an aluminium one. Um, I mean, I've got some chunky great ARC Ultra steel mods, some ARC 5s um, and some... I've used the 7 on the 338, and that's awesome, but it's like a brick of stainless steel. So it'll last a long time, it certainly cuts the noise, and it cuts a bit of the recoil, but it's on a big heavy rifle anyway. And I don't find 338 particularly onerous, especially because the fact it's generally in physically massive rifles to start with. Right, right, Chris Williams, what would you suggest an alternative? Um, well, a 270 is always going to be a bit of a snapper. I have to say, I'm not really a 270 fan. I'd rather have a 306 any day. 270s just they just seem a bit fiery. Um, last one I used, I think I used this. Uh, was it a Stallon? Because it was a Seiko, and GMK sent a Stallon with it. Those are good moderators. House guns are good moderators. DPT, Wildcats. Um, I suppose the thing you've got to you've got to look at budget. You've got to look at materials. You've got to look at the physical mass of it. Because if you put a significantly heavier mod on, you'd probably soon be complaining, oh, this mod's really heavy. But then you'd forget about the fact there was less recoil and maybe less noise. So, yeah. Um, those brands I've just mentioned, the moderators I've all got good experience with. But, you know, none of them are comparable because they're all different rifles, different cartridges, different calibers. For example, DPT, I'm running on a... Um, it's a 17 by one thread running on a 223 Sauer 100 Keeper, which is a cracking rifle, one of my absolute favourites. Um, that moderator does a great job, but I haven't used a 30 cal one on a 3006 yet, so I think it would still do a pretty good job. And I've used the oh, that's just given me an idea actually. I've got this big Predator 12 from Wildcat. I'm going to get a 30 cal um, baffle for it because I'm going to run it on my 300 wind mag because it is a big mod and it'll only go on a rifle with a long barrel. But I've got two 260s that'll fit on it. Won't go on my 223. Um, these are all the same thread. It won't go on my 223 because the barrel physically is only 20 inch. It's not physically long enough to get the mod off the stock. But my 300 wind mag, it will go on if I get a 30 cal um, buffer for it. And I'll be interested to try that. But again, I don't find that a hard hitting rifle. It's just got that big shove because it's heavy bullet not going super fast just feels a bit old school in that way whereas the 270 leans a bit more towards the large cartridge lighter bullets faster speed um, have a look at one of the wildcats or a dpt or something like that right jerry mccann hi chris again what is the rifle on your bench and is it possible can you tell me if that rifle would be good for my first gun and if possible can you tell me the price <laughs> I'm only laughing because it's like trying to remember the price. I know, it was, I know it was an eight, and there was an 88 on it, I think. It was 1,488, I think. I think. It's a Sour 100 stainless XTA. Um, so speak to your dealer, ask them to speak to Sour, and I'll tell you. If you want it for deer stalking, it would be ideal. If you want it as a range gun, it will be functional and you will enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy using one for that very reason this week. But would I choose it as a range gun? No, I wouldn't because it's only a lighter barrel and it's a stalking rifle. You know, the gun weighs maybe three and a half kilos. Um, if you're going to be shooting all day, uh, you know, super long distance, you're going to want a heavier gun, you know, to see a bit more trace from your bullets. 
blah blah blah, big scope, all that kind of thing. It's just a different sort of handling ethos. But you know, I love shooting sporter rifles on sort of mid-range steel because it's so akin to practice for hunting requirements. And I never seek to make long range shots when I'm hunting, but it just means that if I ever do have to, I'm so much closer to my comfort zone for making a, for making good shots. So yes and no, it will be a great stalking rifle, but I won't say it'd be a great range rifle. You'd probably look on, you know, on the SAR 100 range, you'd probably look more towards the 100 field shoot maybe. Um, that's a much heavier gun. Same action, heavy barrel, heavy laminate stock. You know, similar cartridges and calibers, same bolt, different bolt handle. You know, most gun families are based around the action, the furniture, the barrel and the bolt handle and change. So the triggers are often the same and, and that's, that gives them a product range. So it's, it's, you know, it's a bit like having, uh, having a car. They've all got the same engine. One's a hatchback, one's a saloon. You know, hatchback versus target saloon. It's it's changing some parts of it, but not all of them. Um, right, Edward Sheridan. I see Barrett are making Fieldcraft rifle. Are you going to get them to do a review? Uh, I had one, I don't know, three three years ago. Barrett Fieldcraft. Um, so yeah, I did a review on that. Bear in mind, I'll say it again. Up until the last twelve months, I never really did anything on YouTube because I just didn't have the, 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 the motivation or the spare time to do it. Um, right, Stephen Orr, has a name that's always around. Hi Chris, is the Arcarel worth getting on the AI? Well, it's um, it's machined into the chassis, so yes, it is. Um, I think if you're gonna be putting... Uh, PRS isn't my thing. I'm very aware of what it is, but it's not my thing. Not because I, I dislike it, I'd quite like to shoot it, but I've got a bit of a knackered back and various disabilities and things, and I don't really fancy jumping about too much, diving up and down and sort of taking two minutes to kind of groan myself into position. Um, if you're going to put a wide stance bipod on an Arca Swiss rail with the proper, the proper spec ones, yes, I, I quite like them because, you know, you've got longitudinal adjustment and you've also got a good solid lock-up for spacing. I mean, let's face it, my iPhone is sat right now in front of me on an Arca Swiss mount because Arca Swiss is photography based, right? It's been around for a long time. Um, not every brand uses it. I've got a lot of Manfrotto tripods that use their own special foot, but there's a lot of stuff that uses Arca Swiss. And I could take an Arca Swiss rifle and stick it straight in that Manfrotto tripod there, which is Arca Swiss. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing in the world though, because it's a very different use, isn't it? But yeah, the Arcus, I mean, that, um, the Ruger 338 I had a couple months ago, which I took down to, to shoot in Wales, um, that had the full RAS spec, um, RS spec, uh, Arcus was underneath. And I wish I could have got a bipod for it at the time, but the bipod arrived just after the rifle had gone back. Um, and yeah, it gives you a really, really solid mounting position. Because if you're going to have a wide stance bipod on a big heavy rifle like that, you don't want it mounted on a stud where you can get it rocking side to side and twisting and always being a bit wobbly. On a sporting rifle, that's fine, but not maybe on one of those. Right, um, Marcel Gaming. Hey, Chris. Oh, how the Barrett doesn't have a lot of recoil. Is it the barrel or how heavy it is? Which Barrett? Which Barrett? Um, I'm trying to think which Barretts I've shot. I've shot the Barrett Fieldcraft. I've shot Barrett, I think it's called the MRAD. I think I had an MRAD in 338, but I can't remember. Um, it was something. It might have even been a 308 or a 338. Um, but um, most of the big stuff that you go into 338, you're putting brakes on them anyway, and you certainly have a brake on a 50 cal. <laughs> certainly. On a heavy-ish rifle, you can shoot 338 with nothing. It's not that bad. But yeah, 50 cal, no way. So yeah, a little bit more specific there, Marcel Gaming, please. Which Barrett are we talking about? <sighs> Stephen Orr, would the ATX make me a better shooter, lol? <laughs> um, I did a little thing about this the last week, actually, because they asked me to, you know, say, if I could have any gun, what would I have? And it, Two weeks ago, I wrote this little 200-word ditty for um, um, 
shooting times. I really like the Blazer K95 single shot brake brake folding rifle. I really like that. It was just so interestingly different, yet not different. You know, it, it just it just worked so well. It was such a pleasure to shoot, and it was still so nice to shoot. It was very very accurate. Everything Blazer do well, precision and you know the carbon fiber stock on it. It was, I think it was eight thousand quid. Would I ever have one? Well, no, because it's, it's a hell. It's, you know, it's very expensive for a single shot rifle. But it was a lovely, lovely rifle, and it was it was everything good about old traditions with ultimate modernism in materials, modernity in materials. So, would it make you a better shooter? Well, I think it made me a better shooter because I enjoyed shooting it. It was a fun. I mean, I I I I, I tested it in a way I would test anything with decent selection of you know generally available ammunition and it shot very well probably a little bit above average and and that comes with the fact that you had to have a significant positional shift between shots to actually physically lift up rock the top lever open the rifle slot the new round and close it whereas in an all when you're opening a bolt and closing a bolt you can keep absolutely locked in position so given that it still shot super well better than average um it's one of those rifles it, it, it's a joy rifle. Is it better than a bolt action for hunting? No, it's not. But uh, I was looking the other day. In fact, I was talking today to Frederick from Blaza, and he'd just been um, a robot hunting. He used K95, and Frederick's a big guy. You know, he's probably six three, six four, maybe, if not more. And um, you know, that K95 felt quite small in my hands at five foot eleven. Frederick, and in fact, I know for a fact Frederick's also got massive hands. And, and that was the rifle he chose to hunt with because he, he just because he wanted to, you know, and I'm sure he could have chosen from anything from the Blazer, Mauser or Sauer stables to take hunting. That's the one he chose. And there is a certain joy to owning something you just like. And there are some guns I just do like, and that happened to be one of them. Let's just say in the last few days, another rifle has been put on that list. Um, possibly it's at the expense of all the other ones I own. I have made the decision. <laughs> right, Philip Goliath, do you get a 50 BMG and get some epic kill shots? I'll definitely subscribe. Um, no, I won't because it's a bit stupid really and you don't get epic kill shots because they don't expand on anything below enormous. Um, I've shot small things with big guns before, just because it happened to, to need doing, and it's very unspectacular and childish to do it for being purely spectacular. So, Philippe, sorry, I'm not really bothered if you subscribe or not. It's not really my bag. Uh, have you ever went hunting using pistol calibers? And if so, what was your most accurate distance? No, don't do pistols. It's for pistol calibers. Pistol calibers aren't generally legal in the UK for... Um, well, you can probably do foxes with them and things like that, and rabbits, I suppose, but you're certainly not going to do deer, um, unless it's a heinously large pistol, like a, I don't know, would something like a 500 Smith & Wesson be deer legal? I don't think it'd make the velocity, it probably meant, would it make the energy even, I don't know. I shot one of those a few years ago. In fact, my first ever YouTube video, if you scroll back, was in Denmark at the Zeiss thing, and someone had a 500 Smith & Wesson there, and we were all having a go shooting that. It was completely clown-like, but, you know, you've got to do it, haven't you? Right, have you done or would you do a review on the Bagara BA-13 single shot? Chris Williams. Uh, yes, Bagara BA-13 single shot. I have done a review on one. It was, let's go, let's say five years ago. Um, they're all right, little guns, to be honest. Um, I think I did one. Because it was a Bagara, I think they were available in triple two or two, four, three. The Spanish have a, well they definitely did have, and I think they may still do have a thing about military calibers, which was why the, the, the BA-13 came in slightly more unusual specs. A bit like the the, the Bagara, you know, you can get a 308, you can get um, a 6.5 Creedmoor, but you can't get 223s and things like that, and they did a 22-250 I think. Although the 308 is kind of a military calibre, isn't it, uh, in 7.62 so yeah, the BA-13 single shot, it was quite a fun gun to shoot. It wasn't as accurate as the Blazer. It was a whole lot cheaper than the Blazer. Um, I just did a Merkel K3 a couple months ago. 
bit, bit more, maybe three, four, five months ago. And that was, um, again, similar in terms of looks, but there's so much goes in. It's, it's a bit like the world of high-end shotguns. They all look, can all look quite proportionally similar, but the way the mass is distributed through the barrels and the action and the stocks and the timber, this, that, makes fundamental differences to the way they handle. You know, little things like the reach to the trigger or the, the way the, the, the grip fills your hand and the way your hand is angled and the way it makes your elbow sit and the way your shoulder sits. So, oh, pardon me, apologies. Shoulder sits. The way your shoulder sits. Those all have fundamental factors to do with the, um, the way the rifle aims. So, yes, those little things do make a lot of difference. Blaza got all those things right. And they didn't say the other ones get them wrong, but they just seem to fit me. So it was like having a custom gun made. Uh, da, 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 da. Right. Have you heard anything from Strasser regarding a synthetic stock for the Strasser RS? Um, I haven't heard anything from them, but I'm sure I could ask Sportsman Gun Centre. Um, I'll ask them, but uh, it's whether anybody will pay me to do a review on them, because... The YouTube review alone won't even pay for ammunition. So most of the YouTube ones get done as a, as a subsequent. Right, uh, it's 5.7 pistol caliber UK legal. I think that's going to send 62 just packed into a pistol. Pistols aren't UK legal. You might as well give up now, Philippe Galarza. Uh, we, we don't have pistols in the UK. Uh, have you ever gone shooting with a shot? No, hang on. Have you ever gone shooting with a shotgun? If you did, was it your thing? <sighs> I'm really kind of not on your wavelength here, Richard. Have I ever gone shooting with a shotgun? Yes, I've gone shooting with shotguns many, many, many times. Um, I've shot shotguns before I ever shot centerfire or even rimfire rifles. Shot my dad's 12 bore when I was probably about old enough to hold the weight of it. Um, I've still got it. Shame man called me dad as well, but I've still got his gun. Um, I've done a lot of clay shooting. I've done a bit of pigeon shooting. I've done quite a lot of game shooting when I've been invited. Uh, I used to go game shooting with my uncle quite a lot. Um, yeah, so I've I've done plenty of thousands of rounds, thousands of rounds with shotguns here, there, and everywhere. I've, you know, I've used them on trips abroad. I've used them used them in America, I've used them in Denmark, I've, yeah, um, loads of stuff. Shotguns is, I only, I only own two, but um, I say one is my dad's gun and one is a, a Beretta over and under, which is oh, I've had for some years, which is my sort of clay gun and pigeon gun or whatever I need it for. So I like shotgun shooting, it's a bit of a break for me. And the, the thing I always laugh at when I go um, clay shooting is it takes me the first sort of... I have to get back in the groove of letting go of the trigger because if you ever watch me shoot a rifle, you'll notice I squeeze the trigger, the rifle goes thunk and my hand doesn't move. And, and of course, when you're shooting a shotgun, it's like, like bang. Oh yeah, I need to let go of the trigger. Click. <laughs> and the first, you know, clay shooting, the first few stands, I never... It takes me the first few stands to get into the groove of that. So, yes, I have been shooting with shotguns and i quite enjoy it it's not something i take too seriously it's kind of my not work thing um if you ever go i went for oh, a couple of years ago i went to um slovenia with browning and we were we were there to look at some new rifles and some new shotguns it was quite a, a large spec um european journalists and dealers event so over several days you know they shipped new people in and old people out and we were on a clay ground with you know just surrounded by traps it's like it like and we were basically just given the goal of you know you have to shoot all this ammunition because we're not taking it all back to belgium with us and there were just crates and crates and crates and crates and crates and crates of 12 ball cartridges we'd done something similar a year or two previously in poland as well and I think we shot even more then. We were shooting in Poland virtually under the moon. And and still, they say, shoot more, shoot more. Try this gun, try that gun, try this gun, try that gun. We hardly shot the rifles because we just never stopped with the shotguns. Um, so, yes, done plenty of shotgun shooting. Right, well, 
pardon my slight slip of the shoulder or shirt or whatever it was I said was a slight slip of the tongue there, but there we go. Um, thank you for coming by. Thank you for watching. Thank you for the comments. Um, thank you for turning up on Monday night and probably nobody here is in the UK because everybody in the UK has gone to the pub because tonight's the first night they could go to the pub and of course everybody has nothing to do at all other than go to the pub, do they? So <laughs> um, that, that, that clearly never happened. It's been quite a busy evening. Uh, we've had lots of questions. So yes, thank you everybody. Thank you for coming along. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for, you know, watching my channel. And uh, please like, please comment on things. And the more traffic that I see coming my way, the more likely I'm going to put guns your way. Um, certainly in the, in the video sense. In terms of what's coming up at the moment, well, I've got quite a few other projects on at the minute. And I've kind of been trying to get rid of a load of stuff. So the only video on at the moment, I've got a few to do on this. And then I'm done. But that's kind of on Friday this week. Monday next week, it might all just start again. So I'm trying to get something unusual. I want a 2-2 Hornet. I've done 17 Hornets. I've never done a 2-2 Hornet. I've never actually done a 204 Ruger. The only time I've ever shot a 204 Ruger was 10 years ago this year, um, it will be 10 years in July, at the Hornady factory in America, and I've still not done a 204 Ruger. Um, I'd say a 22 250, but what's the point? I used to own one, I'm not really that bothered. Um, I'd love something just, yeah, a bit different, but of course the, the world is a little bit short of ammo at the moment, so I'm kind of just, you know, going steady with what I've got. Um, in, in, in question of other review stuff, um, let's just see what pops up. Follow my Facebook page. Um, I do try to put stuff on YouTube as well. I quite like the unboxing videos and they seem quite popular. I'm not really sure they're that interesting, but people seem to like them. They obviously, it's a, it's a bit like Christmas Day, isn't it? You know, you get to watch someone else open some presents and they're not for me. They go back after four or five weeks. So, yeah, uh, we have some more questions popping at the end there. Or have I just scrolled up the page accidentally? Let's have a little look. 204 Ruger vid will be great. Uh, thanks for the advice, Chris. No problem, Jerry. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Selling my 1522 to finance my... I, thought I, said, I nearly read that as fiancé. Finance my reloading kit. Wish me luck. I quite like 1522s. Um, I'll probably end up shooting one on Wednesday, actually. Um, we, we use them as training guns. Um, they are quite nice. So yeah, finance your reloading. I don't think a 1522 second hand is going to pay for a huge amount of reloading kit. So, you know, don't give up on your gun too easily because a 1522 is a lot of joy in shooting that. And <laughs> I was kind of not that much to do yesterday and today and I thought I could do some reloading and I'm looking at a bench just full of empty brass. And did I do any? Nope. Partly because I haven't got that many primers. I don't think many people have got huge amounts of primers at the moment. So there we go. So yeah, keep me around the channel. I'll keep trying to get the videos on. If I'm not, it's because I'm working, doing other stuff and, you know, got to pay the mortgage, haven't we? So yeah, thanks for watching. Everybody stay safe, look after yourselves, enjoy life, and I will see you hopefully in, uh, in a fortnight. And maybe we'll go back to Tuesdays. As I say, tonight was purely just because it was easier. Bye for now.